Hello, I'm Dustin Kirkland, product manager at Google and your host at KubeCon Copenhagen. I'm joined here by Cash Sajadi. He's the CEO and founder of Cloud66, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his path to Kubernetes. Sure, um, thank you. Um, so we are a SaaS company. We deliver development uh, tools for software companies, and um, as a result of being a SaaS company, we were hosted our applications for the past four and a half years on um, AWS EC2 normal, you know, a setup of a cloud setup. And um, as part of our products, we were building Kubernetes clusters for our customers to deploy their applications. Um, ultimately, the rigidity of including and introducing new infrastructure components to our own infrastructure setup that runs Cloud66 SaaS uh, led us to move over to running Kubernetes ourselves. Um, while we are, uh, we consider ourselves experts in Kubernetes and we build that for our customers, we wanted to decouple the risk and not have too much of an inception, if you will. Uh, so we moved to the best Kubernetes that we could find outside of Cloud66, and that was Google GKE. So um, the migration planning for us took about three to four months to, uh, and most of it was spent around risk mitigation and data transfer planning for our customers to have, we have customers in about 120 uh, countries, so there's no night time, there's no downtime. We had to do that in a seamless way as, as, as much as possible. Um, and then the migration itself took a day. Um, so we planned the whole thing and we did the, the entire thing in a day. So three to, three to four months of planning, planning uh, a day to do the migration. Yes. Um, so our move to GKE was smooth. Um, as a result, we cost, uh, cut our costs, our infrastructure costs by about 60%. Um, but my, uh, I think the best takeaway that we took away from, uh, from moving to Kubernetes and GKE in this instance was uh, it added to agility of our production uh, and operations team. Um, we wanted to be able to introduce new components into our infrastructure like search components. Um, and we didn't want to learn yet maintenance of yet another product or having to go and outsource that from third party product, uh, third party vendors all around, making us more dependent on a variety of different components. Uh, now that 60% that cost savings on the infrastructure, is that primarily uh, savings on the management layer? Um, there is a part that's not very tangible, and that's how much time we spend less on managing infrastructure, which is on the, the another PNL, which I, I wouldn't know much about. I don't have that much visibility over it because it's kind of uh, funny money in a way. Um, but when it comes to spend, we now tend to spin up bigger boxes, as in VMs, and pack them uh, much more efficiently. Before, we had one component that would take over the entire server, but would be utilized at 20%. Now we can move workloads around and make it more, uh, uh, more flexible. Right. Okay, so Kubernetes has helped Cloud66. Tell me a little bit about Cloud66's business. What do you guys do with Kubernetes? Um, so our SaaS product, we have two products. One is the scaffolding and building Kubernetes clusters for our customers, but our focus is not doing that as um, building the container side of the story. We mostly focus on workloads that you don't run inside of the containers, like database backups, replication, firewall, audit management, access to servers. That's called Classics Maestro. And we actually built a product out of our experience of moving to Kubernetes and managing our deployments to Kubernetes, which we call Cloud 66 Skycap or Container Delivery Pipeline. We had to make sure two things happen before we can move to Kubernetes. One is the technical engineering side of it, which you have one application, you usually break it apart into microservices, and then you wrap them into containers and you write a bunch of configuration files for Kubernetes to run. That part is the easy part. As an engineering team, we're you know, fairly capable of doing that. The part that we had to make sure that happens is, we, do we have the tool set to change the mentality of the team that not all, all the entire application goes out at the same time? Some things are dependent on other ones when the deployment happens. How do we know that now that we have two version controls, essentially one Git and one Docker registry, for example, we can trace and track things down? Um, we can track and trace things down in terms of the assets that are now broken apart into hundreds of containers and microservices. How can we take care of security and secrets and also make sure that our IP is not linked into, leaked into one of the layers of a you know, Docker image? All of that led into actually building a product out of that experience. We are a product company. We provide that as a SaaS or on-prem to our customers. So we took that opportunity and, and 
product, productized our, our learnings. Now, application development on Kubernetes takes a bit of a different approach. What, what did you learn uh, on that aspect of your journey, on your, your road to Kubernetes? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so, I've, in previous life, I've worked um, as a software architect for larger enterprises, mostly investment banks. And I've, what I've experienced is was very, very, very similar to the experience that I had with Martin Fowler's way of doing microservices and uh, service-oriented architecture, if you will, uh, based on contracts. It doesn't necessarily have to be broken up into multiple services, but we found that applying those principles when it comes to contract-based development uh, and, and having a, a definitive API, internal API between services always helps, regardless of whether that code base is one code base or you break it about into physical different right. code bases. Great, so I understand that we've got a bit of a demo here. All right, let's see it. Great, um, okay, so um, uh, we had, as part of um, Cloud Six's SkyCab, which is a container delivery pipeline into Kubernetes, I have an application that is just one simple service, and I wanted to deploy that to GKE, so here's, uh, here's what we do. We have a concept of a, uh, of a formation, and formation for us is a, a, a deployment destination. It's like environments don't cut it anymore because you might have five productions and 12 stagings just because you can do that based on Kubernetes namespace. Um, we do that, and here I'm, I'm adding uh, the different uh, parts of the application based on templates, Kubernetes native templates that we have in a Git repository. The idea for us was to not wrap the Kubernetes API into yet another API, to just control the access of our team to Kubernetes. We wanted developers to have the full access and experience the full benefits of Kubernetes when it comes to templates, uh, but also for the ops teams and ops uh, people to have, have a say over how things are deployed. So here I'm setting up a, a, a namespace for my Kubernetes formation. Um, and here I'm, I'm doing a deployment of a service. So this is a normal Kubernetes deploy uh, deployment assets, as you can see. Um, and the idea is that my ops team will dictate if you want to deploy or add a deployment to your Kubernetes, how should it look like? For example, if you're running on GKE, you might want to run on Cloud SQL as well, and therefore you need Cloud Proxy for as a sidecar for production, but this is not a concern for staging, therefore my ops guys can dictate that. I'm going to add the port for my service, uh, enter the command that starts it in a uh, normal Kubernetes or Docker-friendly way. In this instance, I'm running Redis directly here um, as, a, uh, as a container. And this is all backed by a Git repository, so uh, you can use just normal Git flow uh, as opposed to using the UI, uh, web UI. And the last step for, for this is to create a service uh, that represents that deployment. Again, this is my ops team's opinion how the service should look like. And this comes from a Git repository itself, so you can, you can uh, evolve this. Here, because I'm deploying to GKE, instead of a node balancer, I'm using a load balancer. Um, so GKE will fire that up for me, and uh, I save the changes. And because we were running Redis, we are going to run Redis inside of uh, my cluster as well. I'm going to just fire up Redis. Now, this could be a Helm chart that I can get off the shelf and just deploy Redis. Um, or it could be my team's opinion on how Redis should be deployed in my organization. And once I have all those components, what happens is what we call taking a snapshot of your application, which will take a snapshot of all your code base, all pre-built images that you have for your application, and then all of those will result in a rendered set of Kubernetes native configuration files that you can then apply to your cluster. I'm just going to get the command that will generate that. We, we do support multi-accounts, so I'm just going to switch it to our demo account, and then pipe that onto a kube control uh, and apply it to my cluster, which is the GKE cluster that I have. So the namespace, uh, the secret, which would be the Docker registry that we provide, all of that is going to get um, created. The namespace is there now. And let's check the pods. Great, so the pods are running, and I'm going to just quickly check the service to make sure the load balancer is up. OK, so the IP address is now getting, getting started. I'm going to just put a watch on it. 
Oh, it's up now. Okay, so I'm just going to get the IP address that uh, GKE gave me. And there we are. Hmm. So my app was is up and running, but the most importantly, this was a simple app, obviously. Right. But this is based on the opinion that my uh, operations guys want me to have. And I can then switch this formation into another a deployment target that is running a homemade Kubernetes cluster that doesn't require certain things, or I, uh, my ops guys can, can force my developers to, every time they add a new deployment, for example, they need to have a sidecar for log shipping, for example. So it gives you the flexibility of a Kubernetes API without the risks of um, being able to change things in the, in the whole entire cluster that you're not supposed to. Yeah. That's super interesting. Uh, I can see how this would drastically improve and speed up some development cycles, huh? Yep. All right, Cash, thank you very much thank for your you. time. Thank Cheers. You so